Okay, oops. Um, so hey everyone, thank you for, for coming. Hope you're having a good Friday. Um, my name is Cesar Sewell. I'm a research computing associate here at the Center for Advanced Research Computing. And um, basically it's my job to make our uh, compute uh, resources that we make available to our researchers, just make it easier for everyone to use. Um, so I'd like to talk about one of our new-ish services, Open On Demand. Um, what Open On Demand is, if you, if you haven't heard of it before, is basically it's a way for you to use the web browser to interact with our uh, HPC cluster. And you can do that in a couple of different ways. Uh, so I'm just going to spam in the, the link to the uh, slides one last time, because I think I just saw someone come in. And next slide, there we go. So here's the outline. If you go to um, our open on demand, which we'll do in a minute, there's basically there's four um, tabs that you can click on. And that's basically going to be the structure of this presentation. There is a file explorer. There is a way to submit jobs um, using the web browser. There's a way to get a terminal. There's actually a lot of different ways to get a terminal using open on demand, but you could just directly use the website. And then uh, the probably the more interesting part is these interactive apps. Um, so you will be able to use Jupyter Notebooks and RStudio. So theoretically, I can do this, right click on this, and we'll see uh, open on demand. So I'll paste this, oops. I think I've been paid some private messaging ones someone. So let me let me re uh, send stuff in the chat. There we go. Sorry, I'm just spamming chat with messages. Sorry if I'm uh, repeating my messages. Anyway, so here's the tabs I'm talking about. So you can click on these different tabs. And the first one I want to talk about is. Uh, the file explorer. So if you click on this files tab, uh, yeah, so I think one more thing is it'll probably have you authenticate, which I think that should be pretty straightforward. You just type in your USC net ID and your password. So if you click on this files tab, you will probably see something a little bit different, but you should see a bunch of directories. You should at least see home directory, and then probably slash project, and then something, and then slash scratch, and then your username. So these are the directories that you have access to. So I'm going to click on home directory. And it shows me a list of everything that's in my home directory. So pretty much maybe like what you're used to on like a on your local computer, it looks a little bit differently, but you got directories, you got files. Um, for example, I have this file called log. I don't quite know what it is, but if I click view, um, it will show me the contents of the file. And it looks like I was looking at uh, GPU resources. Um, if I wanted to, I could edit this file. So if I click on edit, and I could maybe at the top, I could say like a little description. Um, some data about GPU resources. And I can save it. And if I go back and click view again, so that there's the changes that I've made. If I want to go somewhere else, I can click on this go to and I can type in the directory that I want to go to. I could do like scratch. We'll go to my scratch directory. So here's some more files. And then a nice thing about this is if you have like um, some pictures. So here's this cool.bmp. Click view and it shows the picture 
cool.bmp. Look, that's pretty cool. Uh, I could download. I think this is all pretty straightforward stuff. If you're used to using a web browser, so here it is. There's my cool.bmp. If I wanted to upload a file, where's that upload button? Upload. This is probably a pretty uh, normal uh, interface you're probably used to looking at. So I'm going to upload this. What did I upload? Oh, this presentation. And this is actually pretty neat. This is an HTML file. So it could be the case that you have HTML files as a result of your uh, jobs or something. But yeah, you can look, you can look at HTML, ah, HTML files on the browser. So here's an old presentation I had on, on Pegasus. Um, I think it was an internal presentation. But yeah, so here, that's pretty cool. So that's all pretty straightforward, I think. Um, yeah, you can navigate. So it's a pretty easy way to upload files, download files, just check on your files real quick, especially if you don't like to use the terminal. Uh, the next thing is this jobs tab. So if you click on this jobs drop down, uh, you'll see active jobs, job composer. So let's click on job composer. And I have a couple old, uh, old previous jobs that I was just playing around with earlier today. But this is a view that allows you to submit jobs on our cluster. And um, you know, we probably could talk a little bit about how to use the HPC cluster and what does it mean to submit a job. Um, I, that's a little bit out of scope of this presentation, but just to give you an idea. So if you click on new job, there's default template, template, specified path from select a job. We'll just click on template. And uh, it shows you a different, different kinds of jobs that people may run. So there's GPU, job array, OpenMP, multi-threaded Python, uh, single-threaded Python, so you, you know, you kind of click on the one that you think is most similar to what you want to do. So I'll click on this uh, GPU job. And so you can see it kind of gives you some examples. So I'll click create new job. So here's my new job. And what it did is it copied those example files into my home directory in this path right here. And then it says there's a script called job.sh. And then uh, there's also a, a file called CUDA program.cu. So if we look at this job script, um, this is a pretty, um, I don't know how familiar people are with job scripts. But it's a it's a good starting point. So at the top here, it's requesting uh, GPU resources, one CPU, one gigabyte of memory for one hour, and then it's um, setting the environment to use a uh, basically to build this CUDA program, and then it runs the program. So this is nice. But what if you wanted to make changes? I mean, obviously. If you use this template, you're going to have to change something in it. So let's pretend uh, that I wanted to change this uh, GPU request. So here it's requesting a specific uh, model of GPU. Let's say that I didn't care what model, I just wanted any kind of GPU. So I could click on this edit button, and it gives you a, a uh, text editor within the browser, and I can just delete this part right here. And I could say something like program is done, something like that. 
I can make changes. If you have a different program, you could change the name. If you need more time, more CPUs, you can do all of that. Okay, and then theoretically, I can refresh this tab. And here's my changes have been reflected. So I'll click this submit button. And now it says my job is running. So um, for people not familiar with the way the cluster works, it's requested resources, it's waiting in the queue, and then eventually the job scheduler um, gives you the compute resources that you've requested once they're available. And then it just starts running your program. So that's where we are right now, running. And then eventually, hopefully, it'll be completed. Uh, so while we're waiting for it to finish, it should be done by now. Um, but let's look at another um, method. So here's from specified path. If you already have a job script saved somewhere, um, you can reuse that. You don't have to use our templates and then like go back and rebuild. So I happen to have, um, let me see. Let me pull up my notes. So it's at this path right here, slash project slash HPC root CSUL. A ground, oops, job, batch, learn. Okay, hopefully there's no typos in there. Okay, so this is a um, an old test job that I had laying around. It has some old slurm output files and then test.slurm, wrapper.slurm. So it, it was able to find the files. It copied them to my home directory. And now it's saying it needs a job script. Um, so you can click on these files and you can see if for some reason you weren't sure which one was the job script, uh, you can click on it and you can take a quick look, refresh your memory. So yes, what this job does is it runs s run on this other script called wrapper.slurm and then wrapper.slurm tells you basically which uh, worker it is. So we want test.slurm as the JavaScript. So I'm going to change this and it lets you specify. So I'll click that, everything else looks fine. And then, so we have these two slurm dash number dot out files and then these two dot slurm files. So I'll submit this. And it looks like it completed immediately. That's good. But there is a little bit of um, delay between when the job finishes and when you get to see the output file. So that's kind of why I'm, you know, I went to the GPU and then I'm submitting this other job. So if we look at the GPU job, go back to the first one. We've got CUDA program, which wasn't there before. CUDA program.cu was there, job.sh was there. And then this new file here, slurm dash number dot out. So this is the output of that, of that job. It just prints something to the screen. And so here's the, the evidence that the program ran. And then this is what I added just to say program is done. Uh, we can look at this job again. There's a new file here. I forget which one's which. I'm guessing it's the one with the higher number. So if I click on this, this ran on two compute nodes. This is the job ID, and it just says hello from and then a number. So this is all kind of interesting. Interesting stuff. I, honestly, I don't know how useful, um, how used this, this feature is, but it is possible. And it is kind of a nice nice way to submit jobs, especially if they're, if they're small and you're really terminal averse. So yeah, we went over this. 
Okay. The next um, thing to look at is this clusters tab, which the name is a little bit confusing, but it's basically, it's a way to get a terminal from the web browser. So for some reason, you all you have access to is a, is a web browser. Yes, it's possible to log in. Uh, so I'll click discovery cluster shell access. And probably for most people, that's the one that you're going to want to pick. Um, so now it's asking me to log in. I believe it's already gotten my login credentials just through the web browser. So I shouldn't have to type in a password, but I still have to do duo uh, two-factor authentication. So I'm going to have it. Uh, this is just my preferred method, but just to have it call me. You know, it's a little bit slow. So there's the phone call. I'm answering the phone call. There we go. So I've got my terminal. Um, I can do something like host name, and it'll tell me the name of the computer that I'm on, which is Discovery 2. I can run top. I can see all the activity. Doesn't seem like a whole lot's going on today. But yeah, I could look at the, at the cluster and see what jobs are running. There's a lot happening. So anything that you would do in the terminal, you could do here. I could look at my um, my scratch directory if I wanted to. Uh, where is that file? Oh yeah, here's that cool.bmp file that I was looking at earlier. Yeah, so it, uh, that's pretty straightforward. You just have access to a terminal. Um, the next, which is kind of the most important reason for having open on demand go, are these, these interactive apps. Uh, currently there's two, uh, one is Jupyter Lab and the, uh, the other is RStudio. And so these were um, probably like some of our most um, requested uh, apps to run on the cluster. Uh, and so basically how it works is similar to um, running a job, you request compute resources, and then you're given those compute resources, and then it starts up either a Jupyter notebook or an RStudio, um, and it runs on that compute node. So you're still using the cluster, you still have access to all of your project storage and all of your data, uh, and you're still and now you get to use a web browser to access and uh, run those computations that you want to run. So I think I can click on this. I don't know if that's going to take me to the place I want to go. Oops, wrong button. I'll just do this. So I'll go to interactive apps. I'll do our studio server first. And let's open on demand. It does make it does open up a lot of tabs. <laughs> I'm gonna close all these. So our studio server. Uh, so just go back to the slides real quick. So it's going to ask you about what kind of compute resources you want for your um, either your RStudio or your um, Jupyter Notebook. So here's just like a quick summary table of, of the different things that you could request. Um, so I'll go here and we can just look at them real quick on the browser. So in RStudio server, you can request a specific cluster that you want to run on. Uh, for the most part, probably use discovery unless you have um, compute resources on, on Endeavor. You can, in, uh, if you're using an RStudio, you can obviously, you're going to need to pick a, a version of R that you want to use. You can pick a partition. So which um, kind of compute nodes do you want to use? There's different uh, rules associated with different partitions and different resources. Um, you can pick CPUs, amount of time. So the most you can run uh, is four hours on the main partition or one hour on, on the debug. So if you're just running a, a quick test, which is what I'm gonna be doing, um, should work. This says R412 does not work on debug in one week. 
Uh, I kind of want to just test that out, but <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll do that on my own time, I guess. Uh, so we'll just do a lower version. When you click launch and it takes, at least now it's taking a little bit of time. Okay, that was pretty fast actually. Uh, so it's actually already given me compute resources and it says it's on this host. So it gave me a compute node and then it gives me a username and a password, which is a little bit confusing, but you'll see why. Because you click on this button and then it says, please sign into our studio. And there's no way I'm going to remember this password. And this is uh, a new password every time. So I'll type my username and I'll type in that password. Or I'll paste it in. I'm not going to type that in. And it uh, looks like my old <laughs> R session failed due to a crash. I don't ever use R. <laughs> So it must have been a long time ago. But yeah, so here's R Studio. And um, I don't know too much about R, but I, from what I do know, it seems like uh, when people think of running R, they think of um, R Studio. So um, this is really nice for people to still use the nice uh, interface that they're used to, but also have access to their um, their project storage. Uh, <laughs> I don't quite know how to use it, but so here's everything in my home directory. I assume there's a way to move around and get to your project directory. Um, if you have um, our libraries, we have a couple pre-installed. So if I type library, it gives you some libraries that are currently exist that you can load. So I'll just click on one that has a sort of familiar looking name. I'll do uh, HDF5R. There we go. Let's see what happens. <laughs> of course, I picked the one that doesn't work. Are we able to import data directly from our local computer into this R Studio? That's a great question. Uh, and that brings up an important point, which is uh, these sessions uh, don't have access to the internet. So you can um, probably using the file uh, manager upload your whatever data you needed. And then from our studio, you would be able to see it. Um, I have no idea how our studio works. Could I just like drag and drop a file? No. <laughs> I guess not. But yeah, I, that's probably what I would do anyway, is just go through the file manager and um, you know, go to the directory that you want to do, home directory, and then you could do your upload here. OK, so this is interesting. This didn't work. That's kind of funny. Um, I don't use R, R that much. So I assume that when I, <laughs> I did something wrong, that's fine. Um, but yeah, it, it should be able to find your personal um, R packages that you install. If you want to install new ones, uh, you can go to like the terminal tab and you'll have to do the terminal that way and do your R installs. If there's some kind of dependency, like it's an R, wrapper for something else, like for example, this HDF5, HDF5R is a wrapper for HDF5. I assume that this is not, not set up properly, so that's why it's failed. Um, but yeah, so if you have something like that, um, send us an email and then we can take a look at um, making that uh, library work. So I'm going to close out of this. And I'll, maybe I'll keep that terminal open. All right, so I'm going to close this. It's only been five minutes, but 
There we go, that's good enough. All right, so now I'm gonna start up at Jupyter Lab. Let me just make sure, go through the slides and make sure I covered everything I wanted to cover. Yeah, there's no internet access. Um, if you have data that you wanna use, you have to upload that um, either beforehand or in like in a separate browser window. So I'm gonna go here, uh, Jupyter Lab. I'll pick debug again. Um, everything here seems fine. So launch. And there it goes. It says your session is starting. Please wait. And I'm waiting patiently. I'm feeling a little bit impatient. I'm going to refresh the. <laughs> I'm going to refresh the browser tab. It's still, still starting. Uh, I guess while we're waiting, we can do this. I can run sq dash u c s u o, and this will show all the jobs that I have running. And um, even though I haven't submitted anything, um, I do see this debug and then something called sys slash dash and then something's been running for 43 seconds. This is actually the um, Jupyter Lab session that I've started. So it says I've got two minutes left, about two minutes left and so it's been running for just over a minute. So I guess that makes sense why it's saying I have two minutes left because I've requested an hour. It's running on E09-18, and you can see here, E09-18. So let's connect to my Jupyter Lab notebook. OK. So let's go back to the slides. So that's what we just saw. OK. So there's a couple of different things that we can look at on this Jupyter Notebook. Um, so mostly from what I've seen, I'd say most people, they use this to run Python code. So here's an example. This is from um, one of my colleagues, How He gave a, a Python workshop um, last week or the week before. So here's a notebook that he was using. So it's got a bunch of neat Python code and some and some neat graphs. So that's kind of interesting. So I'll I'll, uh, I'll just run these real quick. It should it looks exactly the same because it's this, it saves the the results. But there's a couple different pieces. So we have this center part, which is like the notebook itself. So it has all the code. Uh oh, that doesn't look good. <laughs> we'll just leave that. Ignore that. I hope it goes away. Um, yeah, so this is the code. And then we have this tab here. This is, I'm currently in this directory, my proj Librosa Spectrum Movies. So this is an old um, session that I was using a, a little bit ago. So I could look at files. I could click around on here and I could see this is my home directory. Um, I could click around and and see whatever, you know, look at different files. There's different notebooks that I have, previous notebooks. Click on this, this one, bisection test. So this is just another example of something I was working on. Uh, but I would like to show, where's oh, this one right here. So this is just an example notebook that I have. It uses a, um, a Python library called LibRosa, which um, is used for reading uh, like song files and doing kind of interesting operations to the data in song files. So let's, uh, if you're not familiar with how Python works, one of the first things you do is you run like this import command. So I'm gonna import lib 
rows of. And it gives you this error message. And it looks pretty scary. It's all red. Uh, and then at the bottom, it tells you kind of what the problem is. It says SND or sound file library not found. So librosa uses a uh, software package called libsoundfile to do some of its operations to read sound files. Uh, so it kind of makes sense that that would be needed. And it also makes sense that if it can't find it, uh, that there, there would be a problem. Uh, so how do we resolve this, this issue? So I'd like to direct your attention to this uh, cube looking uh, icon. Uh, so if you click on it, you will see something that says loaded modules and available modules. So if you're used to using our, uh, our HPC cluster from the command line, maybe you're familiar with software modules. But basically, we have software installed, um, and we make them available as modules. Uh, but just because they're available as modules doesn't mean that your uh, programs can find them. So it says here, can't find libsound file. So what you do is you can type. You could either scroll down, and it's going to take forever to find it, or you can type here, um, SND file. So here's a module called libsound file. I'm going to click load. And now I've got libsound file loaded. And so you would think if I uh, rerun this import uh, that the problem would be resolved. But nope, that's the same problem. So one thing to keep in mind is uh, you have this kernel that needs to be reset. So it's kind of like when you change your modules or change your environment, you have to restart your kernel. I'll do restart and clear all outputs. So restart the kernel. Now I can do import librosa. And nothing happened. That's pretty boring. But that's actually good. Nothing bad happened. So that's good. It worked. So now I can do like one plus one. This is just a test that I had. So load in a file, have it read the file, and um, where is it? There's the cute little picture that it has. I'm, it's been a while since I looked at this, but I believe this is like the spectrogram of the whole of this song right here. So I think like probably this represents time, this axis represents time, and then this, these colors represent the different like sound frequencies uh, present at that time. So that's kind of fun and that's interesting. So this is kind of like the, why people like Jupyter Notebook so much because you can um, quickly have visuals and you can have the old code saved in, in a in a document somewhere. So that's that's pretty interesting. Uh, another reason why people like these Jupyter notebooks is because um, the kernel, so all of the stuff that we've typed in, this is code. This happens to be Python code, but it doesn't have to be Python. But we're using a Python kernel to read in all of these different uh, commands that we're typing, but it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, Python. So let me just make sure I didn't miss anything in my slides and we did that. Um, oh, wait, before we talk about different kernels, uh, no, we can talk about different Python kernels. Sorry, different kernels. Uh, so here's another uh, notebook that I have. This is uh, different syntax. This is Mathematica, or Wolfram language is what they're calling it now. But it's just, it's a just a different like programming environment. So I could choose if I wanted to. If you like, if you like, I guess they're calling it Wolfram language. So if you like Wolfram language, uh, you could run Wolfram language in a notebook. So here's one, it's a cute little graph. 
makes a little like sine curve and there's a hump and you could do something like change this number here and there's less dots do this and there's more dots so if i do three there should be three humps or oh, here's another fun fun one so um yeah, so you can use different languages to interpret this code. Uh, for me, like the, the selling point of a notebook is that you can you can do a quick change like this in your code, and then you can immediately see like how does that change uh, the result. So this is pretty nifty, and it's. In a lot of ways, it's more convenient than uh, submitting jobs. Oops, didn't mean to click on it, but oh well. Or I meant to right click on it. So here's other kernels. Uh, so this is kind of a list of everything that's been registered on the Jupyter um, GitHub page. So there's actually quite a lot. There's a Julia, Ruby, JavaScript, a lot of stuff I've never heard of. I, Elixir, not sure what that is. PHP, Bash. So probably if you like to code in it or write programs with it, uh, there's probably a, a kernel here. So that's pretty interesting. And then, um, so for example, we'll just do Wolfram language. You can click on this page here and it'll give you instructions on how to um, install um, the kernel for that particular uh, language. And then we also have some documentation on our web page. Um, I think I'll skip down a little bit. Yeah, so there's different languages. So like, if you like Stata, here's some instructions for Stata. If you like Julia, if you like MATLAB, Mathematica, this is a, that I, uh, what I did earlier. And then I don't know if I wanna go too, you know, go into too much detail, but a lot of people, they also like to use Anaconda to manage uh, installation of their software and dependencies. Um, and if you notice on our notebook, there's a module, right? So you could load different modules, but the kernel isn't gonna be aware of your Anaconda environment, unless you build a specific uh, Anaconda environment kernel. So here's just a quick example. It's all right if you don't like, um, if you're interested, you know, you could read about it. Um, so here's the commands that you would do. And if you wanted to, if you were really interested, you could look on our on our web page and it describes kind of what's happening here. But just keep that in mind. If you, if you, uh, if you like to use Anaconda, uh, there is a way to use your Anaconda environment in the Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so I believe that's pretty much most of what we want, what I wanted to talk about. Um, if there's any questions or something that you feel like uh, you wanted to know more about, uh, let me know. Uh, I'll be here for a little while. Um, otherwise, uh, thanks for 